Awake in the Night John C. Wright Years ago, my friend Parasalus went into the nightlands. His whole company had perished in their flesh or had been destroyed in their souls. I am awake in the night, and I hear his voice. Our law is that no man can go into the nightlands without the preparation and the capsule of release, nor can any man with bride or child to support, nor any man who is a debtor or who knows the secrets of the monster wackens, nor a man of unsound mind or unfit character, nor any man younger than twenty-two years, and no woman ever. The last remnant of mankind endures, besieged in our invulnerable redoubt, a pyramid of gray metal rising seven miles high above the volcano-lit gloom, venom dripping ice flows, and the cold mud deserts of the nightlands. Our buried grain fields and garden lands delve another one hundred miles into the bedrock. Night hounds, dire worms, and lumbering behemoths are but the visible part of the hosts that afflict us. Monsters more cunning than these, such as the things which peer, and toiling giants, and those who mock, walk abroad and build their strange contrivances, and burrow their tunnels. Part of the host besieging us is invisible. Part is immaterial. Part is we know not what. There are ulterior beings, forces of unknown and perhaps unimaginable power, which our telescopes can see crouching motionless on cold hillsides to every side of us, moving so slowly that their positions change, if at all, only across the centuries. Silent and terrible, they wait and watch, and their eyes are ever upon us. Through my open window, I can hear the roar and murmur of the nightlands, or the eerie stillness that comes when one of the silent ones walks abroad, gliding in silence, shrouded in gray, down ancient highways no longer trod by any man, and the yammering monsters cower and hush. Before me is a brazen book of antique lore, which speaks of nigh-forgotten times, now myth, when the pyramid was bright and strong, and the earth current flowed without interruption. Men were braver in those days, and an expedition went north and west, beyond the land of the abhumans, seeking another source of the earth current, fearing the time when the chasm above which our pyramid rests might grow dark. And the book said Usire, for that was the name of the captain, had his men build a stronghold walled of living metal atop the fountainhead of this new source of current. And they reared a lofty dome. Around was set a great circle charged with spiritual fire, and they drove a shaft into the rock. One volume lays open before me now, the whispering thought patterns impregnated into its glistening pages murmuring softly when I touched the letters. In youth, I found this book written in a language dead to everyone but me, it was this book that persuaded the lovely Helenor, in violation of all law and wisdom, to sneak from the safety of the pyramid into the horror-haunted outer lands. Parathos had no choice but to follow. This very book I read slew my boyhood friend, if indeed he is dead. Through the casement above me the cold air blows. Some fume not entirely blocked by the air clog that surrounds our pyramid stings my nose. Softly, I can hear murmurs and screams as a route of monsters passes along a line of dark hills and crumbling ruins in the west, following the paths of lava flows that issue from a dimly shining tumble of burning mountains. More softly, I can hear a voice that seems human, begging to be let in. It is not the kind of voice that one hears with the ear. I am not the only thing awake in the night. Scholars who read of the most ancient records say the world was not always as it is now. They say it was not always night then, but what it may have been if it were not unending night, the records do not make clear. Certain dreamers, once or twice a generation we are born, the great dreamers whose dreams reach beyond the walls of time, tell of eons older than the scholars tell. The dreamers say there was once a vapor overhead, from which pure water fell, and there was no master of the pump house to ration it. They say the air was not an inky darkness whence fell voices cry. In those days, there was in heaven a brightness like unto a greater and a lesser lamp, 
And when the greater lamp was hooded, and the upper air was filled with diamonds that twinkled. Other sources say that the inhabitants of heaven were not diamonds at all, but balls of gas, immeasurably distant, but visible through the transparent air. Still others say they were not gas, but fire. Somehow, despite all these contradictory reports, I have always believed in the days of light. No proofs can be shown for these strange glimpses of times agone. But when great dreamers sleep, the instruments of the monster wackens do not register the energies that are believed to accompany malign influence from beyond our walls. If it is madness to have faith in what the ancients knew, it is a madness natural to humankind, not ascending, meant to deceive us. As I nodded, half awake, softly there came what seemed to be the voice of Parathos into my sad and idle thoughts. I was called by name. Telemachus! Telemachus! Undo for me the door as once I did for you. Return the good deed you said you would. If vows are nothing, what is anything? I did not move or raise my head, but my brain elements sent this message softly out into the night, even though my lips did not move. Parathos, closer than a brother. I wept when I heard your company was overwhelmed by the monsters. What became of the maiden you set out to rescue? Maiden no more, I found her. Dead. Dead. Horribly dead. And by my hand. Herself and her child. And I had not the courage to join them. How are you alive after all these years? I cannot make the door to open. Call to the gate warden, Parathos, and he will lower a speaking tube from a meurtriere, and you may whisper the master word into it, until prove your human soul has not been destroyed, and I will be the first to welcome you. The master word did not come. Instead, mere words, such as any fell creature of the night could impersonate, now whispered in my brain, Telemachus, son of Amphion, I am still human, I still remember life, but I cannot say the master word. You lie. That cannot be. And yet I felt a tear stinging in my eye, and I knew somehow that this voice did not lie. He was still human. But how could he forget the word? Though it has never been before, in the name of the blood we shed together as boys, the gruel in which we bound our silly oath, I call on you to believe and know that a new sorrow has appeared in this old, sad world, like fresh blood from an old scar. It is possible to forget about what it means to be a man, and yet remain one. I have lost the master word. I have my very self. Let me through the door. I am so cold. I did no longer answer him, but stirred my heavy limbs. Though my hands and feet felt like lead, I moved and trembled and slid from my desk where I slumbered and fell to the floor heavily enough to jar myself awake. How long I lay I do not know. My memory is dark, and perhaps time was not for me then flowing as it should have been. I remember being cold, but not having the strength to rise and shut the window. And this was an old part of the library, so there were no thought switches I could close just by wishing them closed. My thoughts drifted with the cold wind from the window. This wing of the library had been deserted for half a million of years. No one came into this wing, since no one could read the language or understand the thoughts of the long-forgotten people who had sent you, sire, out to found a new stronghold. Only I knew the real name of those ancient folk. Modern antiquarians called them the Orichalcum people, because they were the only ones who possessed the secret of that metal and no other trace of them survived. And so the air masters, during the last two hundred years of power outages, had lowered the ventilation budget in this wing to a minimum. I had needed vasculum of breathing leaf just to get in here, and would have fainted with the window shut. Nor were failures of the ventilations rare. Most windows of most of the middle-level cities stood open these days, no matter what the wise traditions of elder times required. It was two miles above the nightlands. No monster could cross the white circle, and nothing was climbed so high since the incursions of 400,000 years ago. And even if they did, this window was too small to admit them. I remembered wings. In my dreams I see doves, 
or the machines used by ancient men to impersonate them. But the air is thin, and even the dark and famished things have no wings to mount so high. I thought there was no danger to have the window open. Stinging insects, vapors, or particles would be surely stopped by the air clog. But what if the power losses over the last few centuries were greater than is publicly admitted by the Ediles or the Castellan? But it had not stopped the mind call, as it should have done. Many foretellers have dreamt that it is five million years before the final extinction of mankind. Most of the visions agree on certain basic elements, though much is in dispute. Five million years. We are supposed to have that long. I wondered, not for the first time, if those who say that they can see the shape of fate are wrong. I came awake when there was a movement, a clang, behind me as the hatch swung open. Here was a master of the watch, clad from head to toe in full armor, and carrying in hand that terrible weapon called the Discoff. I knew better than to wonder why a watchman was here. He came into the chamber, his blade extending before him as he stepped, and his eyes never left me. The shaft was extended. The blade was lit and spinning. The furious noise of the weapon filled the room. Flickering shadows fled up and down the walls and bookshelves as eerie sparks snapped, and I felt the hair on my head, the little hairs on my naked arms, stir and stand up. I smelled ozone. Without rising, I raised my hands. I am a man. I am human. His voice was very deep, a rumble of gravel. They all say that, those that talk. Slowly, loudly, clearly, I said the master word, both aloud with reverent lips and by sending it with my brain elements. It seemed so dark in the chamber when he doused his blade, but his smile of relief was bright. My youth had been a solitary one. To hold one's ancestors in honor and to love the lore of half-forgotten things has never been in fashion among schoolboys. The pride of young men requires that they seem wise, despite their inexperience, and the only way to appear all-knowing without going to the tedium of acquiring knowledge is to hold all knowledge in weary-seeming contempt. Students and apprentices, and yes, teachers also, bestowed on me their well-practiced sneers. But when my dreams began, and ghosts of other lives came softly into my brain as I slept, then I was marked as a pariah, and was made the butt of every prank and cruelty boyish imagination could invent. Parathalos was as popular as I was unpopular. He was an alarming boy to have as a schoolmate, for he had the gift of the night hearing, and he could hear unspoken thoughts. All secrets were open to him. He knew passwords to open locked doors and cabinets, and could avoid orderlies after lights out. He knew the answers to tests before the schoolmasters gave them, and the plays of the opposing team on the tourney field. He was good at everything, feared nothing, and anarchy and confusion spread from his wake. What was there for a schoolboy not to love? Once, when the head boy and his gang had me locked in the cable wheel closet so that I would be absent from the feast day assembly and gift giving, Parathaus left the assembly, a thing forbidden by the headmaster's rules, took a practice blade from the arms locker and spun the charged blade against the closet door hinges, shattering the panel with a blast of noise. Not just school proctors, but civic rectors and men of the corridor guard arrived. To use one of the great weapons while inside the pyramid was a grave offense, and neither one of us would admit who did it, even though they surely knew. We both were scourged by the headmaster and given triple duty, and had porridge for our holiday feast, while the other boys dined on viands and candied peaches. Parathaus and I ate alone in the staff commissary, our shirts off so that our backs would heal, and shivering in the cold of the unheated room. We were not allowed to speak, but I tipped my bowl onto the board and wrote in the porridge letters from the set speech. Shed blood makes us brothers. I shall return this deed. Even at that age he was taller than the other lads, broad of shoulder and quick of eye and hand, the victor of every sport and contest, the darling of those who wagered on gymnastics games. He was as well-liked as I was ill-liked, so I expected to see doubt. Or worse, a look of patronizing kindness in his eye. 
But he merely nodded, wiped away the porridge stain with his hand quickly, so that the proctor would not see the message. Under the table, with perfect seriousness, he clasped my hand with his, and we shook on it. Porridge dripped through our fingers, but nonetheless, that hand clasp was sacred, and he and I were friends. At that time, neither one of us knew Helenor of High Erie. I had been found in the library by proctors of the watch, whose instruments had detected the etheric disturbance sent by the voice in the night. The monster wackens kept me for a time as a guest in their tower, and I drank their potions and held the sensitive grips of their machines while they muttered in their white beards and looked doubtful. More than once I slept beneath their own aerometers or was examined inch by inch by a physician's glass. I told them many times of my mind speech with Perithaus, and they did not look pleased, but the physician's glass said my soul was without taint, and my nervous system seemed sound, and besides, both the archivist, the head of my guild, and the master of architects, the head of my father's, sent letters urging my release, or else demanding that an inquest be convened at once. I spent the remainder of my convalescence in Darkler, said my father's mansions on level four score and five. Ever since, a generation ago, the power failed along this stretch of corridor, half the country receiving from the substation at Bounta Grace is dark, it has been a quiet and restful place. Among my very earliest memories was one dream, repeated so many times in my childhood, that I filled a whole diary with scrawled words and clumsy sketches, trying to capture what I saw. When I was seven years, my mother died, and her shining coffin was lowered into the silvery rays of the great chasm. My father became strange and cold. He sent my brother Arion's apprentice with the structural stress masters. Tamelos, who was younger than I, was sent to the quarters of my aunt Elegia in Forcourtshire for her to raise. Patricia took holy orders, and Thea stayed with father to run the house and rule the servants. Me, I was sent to board at a school in Long North Hall of Floor 601, where the landing of the boreal stair reaches for many shining marble acres under lamps of the elder days, and potted redwoods grow. When I left home for school, the dream left me. As I recovered at my father's manse, the dream came once again, and it no longer frightened me, for nothing that reminds one of childhood, even ill things, can be utterly without a certain charm. It was a dream of doors. I saw tall doors made of a substance that gleamed like bronze and red gold, which I later found to be a metal called orichalcum, an alloy made by a secret only the ancients knew. The doors were carven with many strange scenes of things that had been and things that would be. In the dream... I would be terrified that they would open. Father and I would dine alone, without servants. The dining chamber is a pillared hall, wide and gloomy. Out of the hatch window, I would often see, across the air shaft from me, little candles dancing in the hatches of some of my neighbors. Once, candles had been used only for the most solemn ceremonies, back when the ancient rules against open flames in the pyramid had been enforced. The sight of candles used as candles always saddened me. Some nights there was a hint of music from some city far overhead, echoing down the shaft, and once the hiss of a bat-winged machine carrying a courier boy, only boys are small enough, down the air shaft on some business of the life support house, or perhaps the Castellan, too urgent to wait for the lifts. Our table was made from a tree felled down in the underground country, by a craftsman whose art is the cutting and jointing of living material, an art called carpentry. Such as father's prestige, he can have such things brought up the lifts for him, but he has never moved the family to better quarters. My father is a big, tall man, with fierce, penetrating eyes and an otherwise very mild face. He shaves his chin, but has a mustache that bristles, and this gives his penetrating eyes a strange and savage look. I have dreamed of other lives, and once, in a prehistoric world, a dusky savage who was me, strong and lean of limb, and braver than I ever hoped to me, died beneath the claws of a tiger. 
The great cat was more bright of hue than anything in our world is, shining orange and black as it slunk through dripping jungles beneath a sun as hot as the muzzle of a culverin. I wonder what became of that species that lived on some continent long since swallowed by the seas before the seas dried up, before the sun died. I have always thought that extinct beast looked something like my father. His bald head was growing back in new hair, as sometimes happens to men of his order. For men who worked near the earth current, their vitality was greater than normal. After dinner, we brought out caress of water and wine, which glistened in the candlelight, and mixed them in our bowls. I am sparing of the wine, and he is sparing of the water, but he is sober even when he drinks deep, and shows no levity nor thick-wittedness. Perhaps exposure to the earth current helps here, too. He sat with his bow in his hand, staring out the air shaft. He spoke without turning his head. You know the tale of Andros and Nyany? You were raised on it. I'm sure I hate it as much as you adore it. I said. Andrew Eddins of Kent and Christina Lynn Murdath, the beautiful. The tale shows that even in a world as dark as ours, there is light. Father shook his head. False light? Will-o'-wisp light. I do not blame the hero for his deeds. They were great, and he was a mighty man, high-hearted and without vice. But the hope he brought served us ill. Perithaus was no Andros to go into the night. And that high-born girl who toyed with your affections. Helenor. She was no Murdath the Beautiful. Helenor the Vain, I should call her. Please speak no ill of the dead, Father. They cannot answer you. He raised his bow with a graceful gesture and took a silent sip and paused to admire the taste. Hmm. Neither can they hear me, and so they will not flinch. She is not the first of the dead who have served the living poorly. He did us ill, whichever forefather first thought it would be wise to leave us tales and songs that tell young boys to go be brave and die, or to perish for a gesture. I said... Keeping a promise counts for more than mere gesture, Father. Does keeping a promise count more than preserving flesh or soul? I said. Those who study such matters say that souls are born again in later ages, even if the conscious memories are lost. Poets claim that oath-breakers are reborn into lives accursed with turmoil and bitter anguish. If so, then each man in his present life must take care to die spotlessly, his soul still pure. Father smiled bitterly. He did not read poets. What point is the punishment if in his next life each criminal has forgotten what crime he did? I said. So that even men who are stoical and hard in this life will fear to break their word. For in their next they will be young and green again. And suffering that comes unannounced for reasons that seem reasonless are surely the hardest pains of all to bear. A pretty tale. Must you die for an idle fiction? Sir, it is not a fiction, he said. Must you die, fiction or not? I had no other friend in my school days. Parathaus was no true friend. And yet I gave my word to him, friend or not. Now I am called to fulfill it. Who calls? There are powers in the dark who can mock our voices and our thoughts and deceive even the wisest of us. Only the master word is one the horrors cannot utter, for it represents a concept that they cannot understand, an essence that does not dwell in them. If what called to you did not call out the master word, you know our law commands you not to heed it. I answered, despite the law, despite all wisdom, still a hope possesses me that he is alive and undestroyed somehow. He said grimly, a true man would not call out to you. I did not know if he meant that a man of honor would die before he let himself be used to lure a friend out into the darkness, or if he meant that what called out to me had not been human at all. Perhaps both. I said, What sort of man would I be if it truly were Perathaus calling and I did not answer? He said, It is your death calling. And I had no answer back for that. I knew it was so. After a space of silence, eventually he spoke again. Do you see any cause for hope you say has taken possession of you? I see no cause. But? But hope 
fills me up, Father, nonetheless, and it burns in my heart like a lamp and makes my limbs light. There are many ugly things we do not see in this dark land that surrounds us, Father, horrors unseen, and there are said to be good powers as well, whose strange benevolence works wonders, though never in a way humans can know, and they also are not seen, or only rarely. There are many things which, although unseen, are real, more real than the imperishable metal of our pyramid, more potent than the living power of the earth current, more real than fire. So I admit, I see no cause for hope, and yet it fills me. He was silent for a while, and sipped his wine. He is a rational man who solved problems by means of square and chisel, stone and steel, measured currents of energy, knowing the strength of structures and what load each support can bear. I knew my words meant little to him. He reached his hand and doused the lantern so that I could not see the pain in his face. His voice hovered in the dark, and he tried to make his words cold. I will not forbid you to venture into the Nightlands. Thank you, Father. Since I have other sons to carry on my name. Visions, pulmonoscopy, and extra-temporal manifestations are not unknown to the people of the last redoubt. The greatest among us are known to have the gift, and at least one of the lesser redoubt also was endowed with the night hearing and memory dreams. Murdath the Beautiful is the only woman known to have crossed the Nightlands, and her nine scrolls of the histories and customs of the lesser redoubt are the only record of any kind we have for the history, literature, folkways, and sciences of that long-lost race of mankind. All the mathematical theories of Galois we know only from her memory, the plays of European, and the music of an instrument called a pianoforte, infinite resistance coil and a sanity glass, and all the inventions that sprang from them are due to her recollection. Her people were a frugal folk, and the energy-saving circuits they used, the methods of storing battery power, were known to them a million years ago and greatly conserved our wealth. Much of what she knew of farming and crops we could not use, for the livestock and seed of our buried fields were strange to her. She knew more of the lost eons than even Andros, and was able to tell tales from the time of the city's ever-moving west, of the painted bird, and of the gardens of the moon. She knew something of the failures of the starfarers, and of the sundering of the earth. More, she also had the gift of the foretelling, for some of the dreams she had were not of the past, but of the future, and she wrote of the things to come, the darkening, the false reprieve, the disaster of the diaspora into the land of water and fire, the collapse of the gate beneath the paw of the south-watching thing, the years of misery and the death of man, beyond which is a time from which no dreams return, although there is said to be a screaming in the ether, dimly heard through the doors of time, the time echo of some event after the destruction of all human life. All these things are set out in the great book, and for this reason Murdath is also called the Predictress. Murdath and Andros had fifty sons and daughters, and all the folk of High Erie claimed descent from them, some truly and some not. Helenor of High Erie was one of those who made that claim truly. When I was a young man, a time came when my future had disturbed those whose business it is to seek foreknowledge from dreams, and I was summoned to an audience. For many generations, the foretelling art had fallen in disrepute, and charlatans rose to deceive the common people. But then a girl of the blood of Murdath was born, whose gift was proven by many sad events. The library of ages yet to be was reopened. The Sibylline book had more treatises of prophecy added to it, and eschatologists compared dream journals and revised their estimates. Even I had heard of her, the Arslips said she was sure to be the next Sibyl. I don't recall the date. It must have been after my initiation, for I wore my virile robe, and my hair was cropped short as befits a man. The blade that was ever after to be partnered with my life, I had hung over the narrow door to my cell in the journeyman's room of the librarian's guildhouse, as only those beyond their fourteenth year are permitted. I remember that the squire to come fetch me called me sir instead of lad, even though he, to my young eyes, seemed incredibly old. I remember the earth current was running strong that year, 
It was my first time at the great lift station for my floor. Invisible forces lifted the platform in a great surge of wind off the deck. Maidens clutched their bonnets and squealed, and many a young gallant, for a strong flow of the earth current makes lads more bold and amorous, took the opportunity to put an arm around fair shoulders to steady a maiden making her first voyage away from her level. Some of the more daring boys leaned over the rail and waved their caps at the rapidly dwindling squares and rooftops of the city before, like an iron sky, the underside of the next deck upwards swallowed the lift platform. I rode the Axial Express all the way to the utmost level. I remember I had to drink a potion made by the apothecary because of the thinness of the air. Fate House, that sits atop the highest stories of the highest city, the hanging gardens of High Erie sit between the shining skylights of West Cupola and the pleasances and airy walks of Minor Penthouse. There are floral gardens here, under glass, as well as pools and lakes amid the rooftop fields of the long, empty aerodromes built by ancient peoples. The domes of Fate House are dusky blue, inscribed with gold, and above the roof tiles, Many a monument of ancient hero or winged genius of the household stood on slender pillars among the minarets. All within was as somber and august as a fane. Here was Helenor, daughter of Eris. I see again the sheen of her satiny dress as she sat beneath the rose lamp on a lector's chair too large for her delicate frame. How like a swan's her neck. All her mass of ink-black hair was gathered up and held in place with amethyst pins, jewel drops like the stars the ancients knew within the clear darkness of their temporary nights. I recall the delicate small hairs, wanton and wild, that had strayed from the strictness of her coiffure and kissed the nape of her neck. None of our pyramid has eyes like that, hair like that, save those descended from the strange blood of Murdas the Beautiful and none but me remembered the grace of the swan, and so none but me could see it in her. Her voice was soft music, each word careful and light, like a brushstroke of calligraphy laid in the air, with what delicate tones she spoke of the grim horrors in the night, the grim future she foresaw nightly in her dreams. We spoke for a time of the horrors of the deception two million years hence, slightly less than halfway between now and the extinction. When colonies of man leaving the Great Pyramid would go to dwell in what seemed a fair country to the west, even as certain legend said, not knowing that the House of Silence had already cursed and undermined the whole of that land, and merely held their influence at bay for millennia, waiting for the memory of these prophecies of Helenor to be forgotten. Whole cities, pyramids, and domes as great as ours would be swallowed and cracked open, and multitudes would die. One entire branch of the human family wiped out, the survivors to be changed into something not human. Then we spoke of my fate. My visions revealed hundreds shall die because of some ill-considered act you set in motion. First one, then many more, will go pelting out into the darkened world to perish amid the ice, or to be ripped to bloody rags by night hounds, to be sucked clean of their souls and left as husks, grinning mouths and eyes as dry as stones. Heed me. I see many prints of boots across the icy dust of the nightlands, leading outward from our gates. I see but one set coming in. I asked, Must these things come to pass? No human power can alter what must be. And power is more than human, she said softly. We foreseers behold the structure of time. There are creatures not quite wholly inside of time, powers of the nightlands, whose malice we cannot foretell, since they are above and alien to the rules of time and space that bind all mortal life. There are said to be good powers, too. A riddle. Man's fate can be changed, but men cannot change fate, I asked. Her full lips toyed with a smile, but she did not allow the smile to appear. We are but drops in a river, young man, she said. No matter what one drop might wish or do, the river course is set, and all waters glide to the ocean. These words electrified me. Ah, I said, forgetting my manners, jumping up and taking her hand. Then you have seen them too, rivers and oceans, 
In visions I have seen and heard the waters flowing, ebbing, pulled by tides, crashing by the shore. There is no sound like it in the world now. She was startled and displeased, and favored me with a look of ice as she drew her fair and slender hand from mine. Strange boy. What is your name again? I spoke a line from old poetry. My people in the highmost towers are learned in such lore, and know old words like river and sea. But no one has seen them, except in the decorations of volumes none can read. I did not say that there was one who could read what others had forgotten. I spoke stiffly. My apologies, highborn one. Your comment thrilled my heart, for I had thought you meant to say that we would do great deeds in times to come, to defy that ocean that must swallow of human lore and history, so that the water course down which the current takes us might be ripped free of its bed and set to a new path. Strange boy, what strange things you say. She recoiled, one slim hand on her soft bosom, her lovely long-lashed eyes looking at me askance. Even in surprise, even when showing disdain, how elegant her every gesture. There was a time when all men spoke thus and did deeds to match. Only men, but she was not looking at me. Her eyes were turned sideways and she stared at some spot on the walls of her family's presence chamber. There were many busts, portraits, and engraved tablets along the walls. I don't know which ancestor her gaze was resting on. In hindsight, it surely was murder. I said, Can you tell me what this ill-considered act might be? Her eyes were elsewhere. She spoke airily, unheeding. Oh? Some chance remark spoken to some girl you fall in love with. My voice was hollow, and my stomach was empty. What? Must I vow to be silent? To speak never more to any woman? It took me a moment to rally my courage. I drew a breath and spoke. If that is my doom, I will learn to welcome it. If I must, I will take the vow and go to some monastery in the buried basements forbidden to woman, that I might never meet my love. Her glittering eyes returned to me, and now a girlish mischief was in them. She said archly, You will defy the structures of time and destiny, and rip up the pillars of the laws of nature, but you will meekly forswear love and speech, merely because you are ordered to it? Backward, boy! You would challenge what we cannot change, but would submit to what we can. That made me smile. Perthal says the same thing of me, always looking backwards. We were walking at the embrasures, and he joked once that Helenor sat upright, eyes shining. She said, You know Perthaus, the athlete? What hour does he stroll upon the balcony? What level? Where? A glow of joy lived in her face, and then she blushed, and my heart ached with pleasure to see her cheek glow. But the thought of meeting Perthaus was such that she could not put away her smile, so she lifted her slender hand to hide it. If you have seen young maidens in the grip of first love, you know the sight. If not, my poor pen cannot mark it. I told her I would arrange a meeting, and the smile came out again. Beautiful was that smile, though not for me, and yet so lovely. They met, at first, with chaperones. At first, one of them could see the future, and the other could see thoughts. Both were bold, nobly born, and love-drunk. How was a duenna to keep them under watch? They died swiftly, those who died, when the three hundred suitors set out to rescue Helenor. The company had been divided into three columns of one hundred men each. Before five and twenty hours of march, the rearguard column had driven off a host of troll things from the ice hills and stopped to rest and tend their wounds. From the balconies and from the viewing tables, we watched them make a camp. It was hard to see, for it was well camouflaged. The tents and palisade were mere shadows among shadows, even under the most powerful magnification, and the sentries at the picket moved without making noise, warily. But then they did not stir again, either ascending from the House of Silence, or an invisible fume leaking from the ground made the sleepers not to wake. Long-range telescopes, glimpsed the survivors, perhaps the sentries who did not lay down, trying to carry one or two men to higher ground. 
The rest were left behind. A pallid slug a thousand feet long oozed into view near the last known position of those men. The monster whacking instruments recorded tiny earth current discharges at about that same time, so it was thought that the survivors swung their weapons once or twice before they died. At about seventy hours, the main column was beset by the great gray hag, mate of the monster slain by Andros, and her fleshy fingers pushed men to the sagging hole that formed her maw, armor and all. The column was routed and fled into the deathly shining lands to escape her. They did not emerge. The shine is opaque, and nothing has been seen again of those men. The scouts accompanying the main column were eaten by night hounds, one by one. The vanguard column lasted until the end of the second week, when the bell of darkness descended from the cloud and tolled its dire toll. Only seven out of those hundred had the presence of mind or strength of will to bear their forearms and bite down on the capsule of release. Those whose nerve failed them and who did not slay themselves in time were drawn silently up into the air, their eyes all empty, and strange little vulgar grins upon their lips, and their bodies floated upward into the mouth of the bell. We all watched from the balconies. I heard from underfoot, like an ocean, the sound of mothers and wives weeping, men shouting, children crying, and the noise was like the oceans of the ancient world but all of grief. The shattering noise of the home call echoing from the upper cities interrupted, ordering all the millions to shut their windows, and lesser horns were sounded on the balconies to pass the warning to the lower cities. The watchmen ordered the blinds raised up on their great pistons to block the windows and embrasures of every city and hamlet dug into the northeastern side of the pyramid, and the towers and dormer windows lowered their armor. I remember hearing, before the blinds closed over us, the whispering murmur of the air clog, straining under double power, raising an unseen curtain to deflect the malice of the tolling bell, lest the sound of it drive mad the multitudes. Parathous had been in the vanguard. The monster wackens studied blurry prints made from long-range telescopes and tried to confirm each death, what little comfort that might have been to the grieving families. Not every corpse was accounted for. My cousin Thais came to see me while I was undergoing preparation. She is pretty and curt, with a sly sense of humor and a good head for chess and math. Thais did not, aloud, try to argue me out of my venture, but she showed me her calculation. The expected average lifespan of men who went forth to save Helenor worked out to an hour, twelve minutes. By traditions so ancient that no record now recalls a time when they were not, those who venture into the nightlands do not carry lamps. It is too well known, too long confirmed by experience, that a traveler cannot resist the temptation to light such lamps when the darkness has starved his eyes for too many fortnights. And so it is thought that since the weapons we carry give off light when they are spun, that those who walk in the night will have light when and only when it is needful, that is, namely, when one of the monstrosities is no further off from us than a yard or two, for then we must strike, we must see to make the stroke. Our craftsmen could make lamps to burn a million years or more. We will not carry them into the dark. The man who will not trust his soul, to warn him of unseen dangers coming silently upon him, is the only kind who needs a lantern in the night. But would such a man, too unsure to trust his soul, be man enough to beat back all the horrors his lantern would attract? We carry also a dial of the type that can be read by touch, for to lose track of hours and proper times for rest and sup is to court madness. There is a script for toting the tablets, made of solidified vital nutrients, which is the traveler's sole food. For there is nothing wholesome in the nightlands to eat, and more solid food, even a bite from an apple, might bring too much belly cheer and relax the discipline of the preparation. Likewise, water is condensed out of the atmosphere in a special cup by a powder made by the chemist's guild. The new water is pure and clear, but bitterly cold, and the cup has that virtue that anything placed in it is cleansed of venom or morbific animalcules. Some travelers hold the cup over mouth and nose when treading lands where the air is bad. The mantle is woven of a fiber that, though it is not alive, is wise enough to shed heat more or less as the deadliness of the chill grows more or less. 
depending on the amount of heat escaping from the ground. The armor is so stern and made so cunningly that even monsters many times the strength of a man cannot dent it, and the joints are fitted at a level too fine for the eye to see. A blessing in the metal, an energy not unlike what throbs so purely in the fires of the white circle, is impregnated into the helm and breastplate to help slow those particular influences that attack the brain and freeze the heart. Arms, armor, mantle, are made by craft a million years has perfected, and they are fair to the eye, but grim and without ornament, as befits the sobriety of the undertaking. At last the torment of the preparation chambers ended. I was oddly clear-headed after the fasting and the injections, and I had endured the test of being forced to view that which still lives, pinning to a slab and sobbing within the refrigerated cell at the center of the secret museum of the monster wackens. I had read the bestiaries of former travelers returned sane from outer voyaging, and learnt what they said of the ways and habits of the night beasts, and I understood why such journals are not shown to any save those whose quest carries them outside our walls. The capsule of release still ached within the tender flesh of my forearm, and the hour of parting was come. The lamps of the final stair were darkened. The watchmen, armed with living blades and armored in imperishable gray metal, stood for a time in silence, composing their thoughts, so that no disturbance in the ether, no stray gleam of thought or metal or sudden noise, would tell the waiting horrors of the nightlands that a child of man had strayed among their cold hills. I stood with my face pressed to the periscope for many minutes, and the escort with me showed no impatience, for they knew it was my life I staked at hazard on my judgment of the ground. At last I raised my hand. The master of the gatehouse saluted me with his dark discus, and the door tender closed the switch that sent power to the valves. The metal leaves of the inner gate swung shut behind me, and then the outer leaves swung open very swiftly and silently. Out I stepped. The ashy soil crunched beneath my boot. The air was as chill as death. The outer valve was already shut behind me, and two layers of armor heavily closed back over it, locking pistons clicking shut, almost without noise. If a monster were not to lunge across the circle from the all-surrounding darkness, or a presence to manifest itself, the door wardens were obliged to do nothing but guard the door. I was already beyond rescue. None within would come out for me, as I was now going out for Parathaus, and he had gone out for his fair Helenor. Prudent men, they all. It was but a few minutes' walk, no more than half a mile, until I crossed the place where a hollow tube of transparent metal, charged with holy white energies, makes a circle around the vast base of the pyramid. It is held to be one of the greatest artifacts of ancient times. The one thing that keeps all the malefic pressures, the eerie calls and poisonous clouds and groping fingers of subtle force, at bay. The hollow tube is two inches in diameter, hardly higher than my boot top. It only took a single step to cross it, but I must clear my mind of all distempered thought before the unseen curtain would part from me. My ears popped with a change in pressure. It is customary not to look back when one steps across the line of light. I was inclined to follow the custom. My father had not been present to see me off. We who live within this mountain-sized fortress of a million windows of shining light, we cannot see where flat, high, rocky plains lift their faces into our light. The long, dark shadows cast by the rocks and hillocks and moss bushes radiating away from the pyramid Darkness that never moves, straight and level as if drawn by a ruler. Even the smallest rock has a train of shadow trailing away from it, reaching out into the general night, so that looking left and right, the traveler sees what seem to be a hundred hundred long fingers of gloom, all pointing straight toward the last redoubt of man. But no traveler is unwise enough to step into such a high plain lit so well. The bottom mile of the pyramid is darkened, her base level cities long abandoned, and the lower windows covered over with armor plate. A skirt, as it were, of shadow surrounded the base of the pyramid, 
and one must travel away from the pyramid to expose oneself to the shining of the many windows of the last redoubt. Even before leaving the protection of the skirt of shadow, there are many places where the ground has been tormented into crooked dells and ragged shapes, dry canyons or deep scars from the ancient glaciers or the far more ancient weapons of prehistory. Such broken ground I sought. I entered the canyons to the west within the first two hours of traveling and encountered no beasts, no forces of horror. My way was blocked by a river of boiling mud shown on none of our maps. The telescopes and viewing tables of our pyramid had never noted it, despite that it was so close to us, for ash floated in a layer atop the mud flow and was the same hue as the ground itself. It was not visible to me until my foot broke the sticky surface, and I scalded my foot. Perhaps it was newly erupted from some fire hole, or perhaps it had been here for centuries. We know so little. This mud river drove me south and curving around the side of the pyramid, and I marched thirty hours and three. I ate twice of the tablets and slept once, finding a warm space behind a tall rock, where heat and some uncouth vapor escaped from a rent in the ground. Before I slept, I probed the sand near the rent with the hilt of my discus, and the little serpent, no more than an L in length, reared up. It was a blind albino worm of the kind called the amphisbena, for its tail had a scorpion stinger. I slew it with a fire-glittering stroke from my roaring weapon, and the heavy blade passed through the worm as it were made of air, and the halves were flung smoking to either side. It was with great contentment I slept deeming myself to be a mighty hero and a slayer of monsters. The encampment and stronghold of Usire, I knew from my books and from my memory dreams, lay to the north by northwest beyond the shoulders and back of the northwest watching thing. There are other watchers more dreadful, but none is more alert, for the ground to the northwest is wide and flat in prospect, and it is lit by the veil of red fire and there is neither a crown nor eye-beam nor wide dome of light to interfere with the view the monster commands. To go to the country beyond the creature, my way must go far around, for the north way was too well watched. To my west was the pit of red smoke itself, a land of boiling chasms and lakes of fire, impassable. To the east of me I could see the silhouette of the gray dunes, and here was a sunken country populated by thin and stilt-legged creatures, much in shape like featherless birds, and they carried iron hooks, and they were very careful never to expose themselves to the windows of the pyramid as they stirred and crawled from pit to pit. The canyon walls were riddled with black doorways from whence, now and again, the wailing, which gives the place of wailing its name, would rise from these doorways, and the bird things would caper silently and flourish their hooks. To the east I would not go. I went south. Each time I rose after snatched sleep, the shapes of two of the great watching things, malign and silent, were closer and clearer to my gaze. First, to my right, rising vast and motionless, the thing of the southwest was but a dim silhouette, larger than a hill. It was alive, but not as we know life. There was a crack in the ground at its feet from which a beam of light rose to illume part of that monster cheek and cast shadows across its lowering brow. Its bright left eye hung in the blackness, slit-pupiled and covered with red veins, seemingly as big as the full moon that once hung above a world whose nights came and went. Some say this eye is blinded by the beam, and that the beam was sent by good forces to preserve us. Others say the beam assists the eye to cast its baleful influence upon us, for it is noted by those whose business it is to study nightmares that this great cat-like eye appears more often in our dreams than any other image of the nightlands. I remember my mother telling me once how a time came when that great eye, over a period of weeks, was seen to close, and a great celebration was held in the many cities of the pyramid, and they celebrated for a reason they knew not why. They knew only that the eye had never before been known to close, but the lid was not to stay closed forever and I. In eleven years' time, a crack had appeared between the upper and nether lid, for the monster was only blinking a blink. Each year the crack widened. By the time I was born, the eye was fully opened, and so it had been all of my life. Second, to my left, 
was the great watching thing of the South, which is larger and younger than the other watching things, being only some three million years ago that it emerged from the darkness of the unexplored southern lands, advancing several inches a decade, and it passed over the road where the silent ones walk between twenty-five and twenty-four hundred thousand years ago. Then, suddenly, some twenty-two hundred thousand years ago, before its mighty pause, there opened a rent in the ground, from which a pearl or bubble of pure white light rose into view. Over many centuries the pearl grew to form a great smooth dome some half a mile broad. The watching thing of the south placed its paw on the dome, and it rises no further, but neither has the watching thing advanced across that mighty dome of light in all these years. It is known from prophecy that this is the watcher who will break open the doors of the pyramid with one stroke of its paw, some four and a half million years from now, but that the death of all mankind will be prevented for another half million years by a pale and slender strand of white light that will emerge from the ground at the very threshold of the great gates. More than this, the dreams of the future do not tell. Between the watching thing of the south and of the southwest, the road where the silent ones walk runs across a dark land. The road was broad and could not be crossed except in the full view of the watching things to the south and the southwest. But the ground on the far side of the road is dim, lit by few fire pits, and coated with rubble and drifts of black snow where a man could hide. In this direction was my only hope. Suppose that the eye-beam does indeed blind the right eye of the watching thing of the southwest, and suppose again that the dome of light troubles the vision of the great watcher of the south more than the monster wackens have guessed. I could cross the great road on the blind side of the southwest monster and sneak between him and his brother, perhaps to hide among the black snowdrifts beyond. I would then follow the road as it wound past the place of the abhumans, and then leave the road and venture north into the unknown country called the place where the silent ones kill. Many weeks of terror and hardship passed, and my supplies grew sparse. Once a party of abhumans came upon me by surprise. I slew two of them with my discus, though it was a near thing, and I fled when the others stopped to chew their comrade. Once a luminous manifestation meant to wrap me in her misty arms, but the fire which spun from my weapon could do hurt to subtle substances, even when there was no material substance for the blade to bite. Swirled lightning dispelled part of the tension that held her cloudy fingers together, and she flew off, maimed and sobbing. Once a nighthound ran at me suddenly from the darkness, and I chopped him in the neck before he could rend me. The blade of the discus shot sparks into the smoldering wound, and the monster's huge limbs jerked and danced as it fell, and it could not control its jaws enough to bite me. A soft voice from the corpse called me by name and spoke words of ill to me, but I fled. I will not write down the words in this place. It is not good to heed things heard in the nightlands. As I passed through the abhuman lands, they grew aware of me and hunted me. I was driven far away from the road into lands that grew ever colder. Each time I lay down to sleep, the hills between me and the pyramid were higher. A time came when I passed beyond the sight of the last redoubt. Even the tallest tower of the monster wagons was not tall enough to see into this land where I now found myself. I was beyond all maps, all reckoning. At first I walked. Each score of hours my dial counted, I slept four. Because there were crevasses, I struck the ice before me with the haft of my weapon as I walked. Then I grew aware of how loudly the echo of my metallic taps floated away across the utter darkness of the icy world, and I grew very afraid. After this I crawled across the ice in utter blackness. I surely crawled in circles. After four score more hours, about half a week of crawling, I felt a pressure in the air. It was so malign that I was certain one of the outer presences must be standing near. All was utter black, and I saw nothing but ghosts of light starved eyes create. For about an hour I crouched with my forearm bare, my hand numb without my gauntlet, and the capsule touching my lips. But the pressure against my spirit grew no greater. I heard no sound. So I crawled away. Over many hours I crawled and slept and crawled again, but whatever stood on the ice behind me, I could sense its power. 
even as a blind man can feel when the door of an oven is opened across the room. I took my bearings from this and kept the power forever behind me. The time came when I saw light in the distance. I went toward it, and over very many hours I began to sense the downward slope of the ice. The path soon became broken, and I crawled from crag to crag, from high hill to low hill of ice. The light grew clearer as I trudged down the mighty slope of ice, and I could see the footing well enough to walk. I put my spyglass to my eye and scanned the horizon. Here I saw, looming huge and strange, the head and shoulders of the northwest watching thing. The crown of its head was mingled with the clouds and smokes of the nightlands, and to the left and right of his shoulders, like wings, I saw long, streaming shafts of pure and radiant light. This was the reflected glow of the last redoubt, bright the dark air of the night world. I was behind the watcher, seeing it from an angle no human person had ever seen it. The last redoubt was blocked from view. I was in the shadow of the monster. A cold awe ran through me then, as if a man from the ancient times were to wake to find himself on the side of the moon, back when there was a moon that forever turned its face away from earth. I had come into the place where the silent ones kill. When Helenor's father forbade the courting of Perithaus to go forward, they began to meet by secret, and my father's mansions, the darkened passages of Dark Lairstead, were used for the rendezvous. I helped Perithaus because he asked it of me, and I felt obligated to do him a good turn, even though it troubled me. As for Helenor, she was beautiful, and I was young. She barely knew I existed, but I could deny her nothing. She had many suitors. How I envied them. Once, not entirely by accident, I came across where Perithaus and Helenor sat alone in a bower before a fountain in the greenhouse down the corridor not far from the doors of my father's officer's country. The greenhouse was built along the stairs of Waterfall Park, downstream from where a main broke a thousand years ago. Near the top, it is a sloping land of green ferns under bright lamps, and the water bubbles white as it tumbles from stair to stair, with small ponds shining at the landings. Near the bottom, the ceiling is far away, and the lamps were dim. At the bottom landing is a statue of the Founder's Lady, surrounded by naiads, and water poured from their ewers into a pond bright with dappled fish whose fins were fine as moth wings. Through the obscuring leaves that half hid them, I saw Perithaus sitting on the grass, his back resting on the fountain's raised lip, and one arm around Helenor's bare shoulders. In his other hand he held a little book of metal, of the kind whose pages turned themselves, and the letters shined like gems. Ferns and flowering iris grew to their left and right, half surrounding the pair in flowery walls. Her head was on his shoulder, and her dark hair was like a waterfall of darkness, clouding his neck and chest. In this wing of the greenhouse, many of the lamps had died a century ago, and so the air was half as bright here as elsewhere. To me, the view seemed like a cloudy day or a sunset but I was the only one in all mankind who knew what twilight was. How strange that, so many millions of years after it could not ever be found again, lovers still sought twilight. As I approached, I heard Helenor's soft laugh, but when she spoke, her whisper was cross. Here he comes, just as I foresaw. Parathaus whispered back, The boy is sick for love of you but too polite to say aloud what is in his mind. But not polite enough to stay where he is not welcome, she scolded. Hush, he hears us now. I pushed aside the leafy mass of fern. Crystal drops as small as tears clung to the little leaves and wetted me when I stepped forward. Now she was primly kneeling half a yard from him, and her elbows were in the air, for she had pulled her hair up, and in some fashion I could not fathom, fixed it in place with a swift and single twist of her hands. The same gesture had drawn her silken sleeves that had been falling halfway to her elbow back up to cover her shoulders. Perithaus, one elbow languidly on the fountain lip, waved his book airily at me, the most casual of salutes. Telemachus, the lad who lived a million lives before. What a surprise this would have been, eh? And he smiled at Helenor. 
I bowed toward her and nodded toward him. My lady, Clairefowl's, excuse me, I was just... Helenor favored me with one cool glance from her exotic tip-tilted eyes and turned her head, her slender hands still busy pinning her hair in place. If anything, her profile was more fair than her straight glance, for now she was looking down. I saw that there were amethyst-tipped hairpins driven point-first in the soil at her knees, and the drop of her lashes gave her an aspect both pensive and demure, achingly lovely. Seeing himself ignored, Perthaus plucked up a fern leaf and reached over to tickle Helenor's ear. She frowned, though clearly she was not displeased, and made as if to stab his hand with one of her jeweled pins. Perthaus playfully, but swifter than the eye could see, grabbed her slender wrist with his free hand before she could stab him, and perhaps would have done more, but he saw my eyes on him and casually released her. I wondered how he dared be so rough with a woman so refined and reserved, but she was smothering a smile, and her dark eyes danced when she looked on him. I said awkwardly in the silence, I had not expected to find you here. Parasols? By which you mean you expected us to flee before we let ourselves be found. Come now, there is no need to be polite with me. I see your dark thoughts. You came to gaze on Helenor. Well, who would not? She knows it as well. How many suitors have you now, golden girl? Three hundred? My heartbeat was in my face, for I was blushing. But I said merely, I hope you see my brighter thoughts as well. Of the three of us, surely one should be polite. Parathaus laughed loudly and was about, I could see from his gesture, to tell me to go away. But Helenor, her calm unruffled, spoke in her voice that I and I alone knew had the cooing of doves in it. Please, sit. We were reading from a new book. There are scholars in South Bay Window on level 475 who have challenged all the schoolmen and wish to reform the ways the young are taught. I did sit, and I thought that Helnor must have been well-bred indeed to invite so unwelcome an intruder as I was to consume the brief time she had to share with her young wooer. She passed the book to me, but I read nothing. Instead, I was staring at sketches that had been pinned into the flyleaves. Whose hand is this? I said, my voice hoarse. Helenor tilted her head, puzzled, but answered that the drawings were her own, taken from her dreams. I know, I said, my head bowed. And by the time I raised my eyes, I had remembered many strange things, things that had happened to me but not in this life. They both looked so young, so achingly young, so full of the pompous folly and charming energy of youth, so inexperienced. Parathaus was looking at me oddly. Though I do not have his gift, I would venture that I knew his thought then. He saw what I was thinking, but did not know how someone my age could be thinking it. Parathaus said, Telemachus will be against it no matter what the South Bay window scholars suggest. All new things pucker up his mouth, for they are sour to his taste. Only when they are worse than the old things, I said. Parathaus tossed a leaf at me. For you, that is each time. Almost each time. Mostly what is called new is nothing more than old mistakes decked out in new garb. The new learning is revolutionary and hopeful. Come. Shake off the old horrors of old dreams. The world is less hideous than we thought. These studies prove that the outside was never meant for man. Do you see the implication? I shook my head. He said happily. It implies that our ancestors did not come from the nightlands. We are not the last of a defeated people, no, but the first of a race destined to conquer. The Bay scholars claim that we have always dwelt in this pyramid and deny what the old myths say. Look at the size and shape of the doors and door handles. It was clear that men first evolved from marmosets and other creatures in the zoological gardens. Our ancestors kept other creatures who bore live young, cats and dogs and homunculi, you see, in special houses. This was back before the second age of starvation. I assume our ancestors ate them to extinction. I blinked at him, wondering if he had lost his mind, or if I had lost my ability to tell when he was joking. Evolved? 
by natural selection, blind chance. We were the first animals who were of a size and stature to pass easily down these corridors and enter and exist the places here. Other creatures were too large or too small, and these were cast out in the nightlands after many unrecorded wars of prehistory. The new learning allows us hope to escape from the promise of universal death for our race. We need merely wait for the time when we will evolve to be suited to fit the environment outside, and we will be changed, and those horrors will no longer seem hideous to the changed brains of the creatures we shall become. I said sternly, The old learning speaks of such a possibility as well. It is hinted that the abhumans were once true men, before the House of Silence altered them. The tradition of the capsule of release is not without roots. Prejudice. Antique parochialism. The only reason why what we think of as true men prevailed is because our hands were best fitted to work the controls of the lifts and valves. Our eyes best adapted to the lighting conditions, and we were small enough to enter the crawl spaces if giants chased us. Those giants outside are outside because they were too big for these chambers. And if we never dwelt in any place except this pyramid, whence came the ancestress of Helenor? Whence came Murdath? Or does your book prove she does not exist as well? He opened his mouth, glanced at Helenor, who gave him an arch look, and closed it again. He dismissed the question with an airy wave of his hand. Whatever might be the case here, skepticism will break down all the old rules and old ways and leave us free to live as we wish and love as we wish. Who could not long for such a thing? Those who know the barren places where such wishful thinking leads, I said heavily, climbing to my feet. Unexpectedly, Parathaus seemed angry. He shook his finger at me. And where does thinking like yours lead, Telemachus? Are we always to be frozen in place, living the lives our ancestors lived? I did not then guess, though I should have, what provoked him. The traditional way of arranging a marriage, and so by extension the traditional way of doing anything, could not have had much appeal for him, not just then. I spoke more sternly than I should have. We are men born in a land of eternal darkness. We grope where we cannot see clearly. Why mistrust what ancient books say? Why mistrust what our souls say? Our forefathers gave us this lamp, and the flame was lit in brighter days when men saw further. I agree the lamplight of such far-off lore is dim for us, but surely that proves it to be folly, not wisdom, to cast the lamp aside, for then we are blind. He said, What use is light to us if all it shows us is images of horror? I said, there are still great deeds to be done. There will be heroes in times to come. And I did not say aloud, but surely Parathal saw my thought. Unless this generation makes all its children to forget what heroism is. Bah! said Parathal. His anger was hidden now, smothered somewhat beneath a show of lightheartedness. He smiled. Will our writings be published in any other place than within these walls? Why will we do praiseworthy acts? when we know there will be nothing and no one left to sing our praises. Even you, who claims you will be born once more, will have no place left to be born into when this redoubt falls. I said, Do not be jealous. I am not unlike you. This life could be my final one. You both have had others you forget, but this could be the first you will remember next time. Parathaus looked troubled when I said this. I saw on his face, how eerie my words, which seemed so normal to me, must have sounded to him. Helenor said eagerly, What do you remember of us? Were Parathos and I? But then she broke off and finished haltingly. How did the three of us know each other before? I said, You were one of Usire's company, and lived in a strong place, a place of encampment, in a valley our telescopes no longer see for the watching thing of the northwest moved to block the view once the House of Silence smothered the area with its influence. You, milady, were an architect, for women studied the liberal arts in those strange times, and you were possessed of the same gift you have now. In those times you saw these ages now, and you sculpted one of the oracalcum doors for the main museum of Usire's stronghold, and wrought the door panels with images of things to come. Parathaus smiled sourly. 
What Telemachus is not willing to say is, I interrupted him. Madam, I was favored by you then, though I was of high rank and you were not. I helped sculpt the other door with images of things that had been. Helenor looked embarrassed. I hoped my face did not show the shame I felt. I turned to Perthaus, but I continued speaking to Helenor, though I did not look at her. Since we are being honest and free with each other's secrets, what Perthaus is not willing to say is, he cannot fathom why I am not jealous of your love for him, even though he sees in my mind that I am not. He sees it, but he does not believe it. But that is the answer. Last time, he lost. This time, me. It does not mean we are not friends, and always will be. Helenor was disquieted. I could see the look in her eye. So I have not loved the same man in all ages, in every life. She was no doubt thinking of Murdas the Beautiful, whose own true love was constant through all time. I said awkwardly, You have always loved noble men. But she was looking doubtfully at Perithaus, and he was looking angrily at me. Odd that he was now angry. Surely I had said no more than what he had been about to say was in my mind. But perhaps he did not expect Helenor to take seriously the thought that they were not eternal lovers. Perthaus said, No doubt if we three are born in some remote age in the future, and find ourselves the very last left living of mankind, you will seek to do the noble deed of poisoning minds against me, and worming your way into intimacies where you are not wanted. Is this the kind of praiseworthy and noble things you practice, Telemachus? Angry answers rose to my lips, but I knew that, even if I did not say them aloud, Perthaus would see them burning in my heart. With no more than a nod and a muttered apology, how glad I was later to have uttered it, even if they did not hear, I spun on my heel and marched from the grove, dashing the wet ferns away from my face with awkward gestures. The scattered drops dripped down my cheeks. Behind me, I heard Helenor saying, Don't speak ill of Telemachus. Perthaus spoke in a voice of surprise. What is this? which I took to be a sign that she had not had in her mind what to say before she spoke. She said, I foresee that my family will bring more pressure to bear against Telemachus, for my father suspects he knows the secret places where we meet. He will bear it manfully and not betray us, though his family will suffer for it. You have chosen your friend well, Perthaus. Perthaus said, Ah, well, he actually chose me. She murmured something softly back. By then I was out of earshot. My dial marked sixty hours passing while I descended the icy slope into this land, place where the silent ones kill, and I slept twice and ate of the tablets three times. The altimeter built into the dial measured the descent to be twenty-two thousand feet. During the middle part of that time I passed through an area of cold mists where the air was unhealthy, and left me dazed and sick. This area of bad mist was a low-hanging layer of cloud. The cloud formed an unseen ceiling over a dark land of ash cones, craters, and dry riverbeds, lit now and again by strange slow flares of gray light from overhead. The ash cones in this area were tall enough to be decapitated by the low-hanging clouds. I spent another thirty hours wandering at random in this land, hoping to stumble across some feature or landmark I would know from my memory dreams. Once, a flickering gray light of particular intensity trembled through the clouds above. I saw the silhouette of what I thought, at first, was yet one more ash cone, but it had a profile. I saw heavy brows, slanting cheeks, the muzzle and mouth parts of a behemoth, but huge, far more huge than any of his cousins ever seen near the last redoubt. A new breed of them, perhaps. It was as still as a watching thing, and a terrible awareness, a sense of sleepless vigilance, came from it. It was taller than a fixed giant, for the dread face was wrapped partly in the low-hanging clouds, and wisps blew across its burning, horrible eyes. How one of that kind had come to be here, or why, was a mystery before which I am mute. 
I looked left and right. In the dim and seething half-light of the cloud overhead, it seemed to me that there were other behemoths here. Two more I saw staring north, their eyes unwinking. I traveled along the bottoms of the dead riverbeds after that, hoping to avoid the gaze of the behemoths. But now I knew the place I sought lay in the direction the giant creatures faced. The gray light faded, and I walked in darkness for thirty-five hours. A briefer flare of gray light came again, and I saw in the distance a great inhuman face gazing toward me, and yet I saw nearer at hand another behemoth to my left facing toward him. By these signs, I knew the massive shadow rising between me and that far behemoth was what I sought. The colorless light flare ended, and all was dark as a tomb. But I felt a faint pressure, as of extraterrestrial thought reaching out, and I feared the behemoth facing me over all those miles had seen me. I crept forward more warily. The ground here was becoming irregular underfoot, sloping downward. I walked and crawled across the jagged slabs of broken rock I found beneath my feet and fingers, ever downward. I could not see enough to confirm whether this was a crater lip. After another mile, ground changed under my hands. Here there was ash and sand underfoot, for soft debris over the eons had filled this crater bottom. I was able to stand and move without much noise, and I waved the haft of my weapon before me in the dark as I walked, the blade unlit like a blind man's cane, hoping it would warn me of rocks or sudden pits or the legs of motionless giants. After an hour's walk or two, under my boot, I felt smooth and hard stones. Stooping, I traced their shape in the dark. They were square, fitted together, man-made, a road. A few more steps along, I felt something looming in the utter dark near me. By touch, I found it was a steely, a milestone cut with letters of an ancient language. I knew the glyphs from former lives. The name spelled Usire. One hundred, two hundred paces further on, and my fingers touched the pillars and post of a great gate. I touched a bent shape that had once been a hinge. I touched the broken gate bars, the shattered cylinders that had once been pistons holding these doors shut against the night. Beyond the doors I felt nothing but more sand, and here and there a slab of stone or a huge column of bent and rusted metal. I sensed nothing alive here, no earth current pulsing through power lines, no throb of living metal. The place where wholesome men dwell often will carry a sense in the ether, like the perfume of a beautiful woman who has just left the chamber, a hint that something wholesome and fair had once been here. There was nothing like that here. Instead, I felt a coldness. I felt no horror or fear in my heart, and I realized how strange that must be. I was surely near the center of where a ring of the behemoths bent their gazes. Even in the dark, I should have felt it as a weight on my heart, a sense of suffocation in my soul. Instead, I was at ease, or else benumbed. How very silent it was here. Slowly at first, and then with greater speed, I backed away from the broken gates that once had housed the stronghold of Usire. Blind in the utter dark, I ran. I was still in the open when the gray light came again, and slowly trembled from cloud to cloud overhead, lighting the ground below with fits and starts, a dull beam touching here, a momentary curtain of light falling there, allowing colorless images to appear and disappear. I beheld a mighty ruin where once had been a metropolis. Its dome was shattered and rent, and its towers were utterly dark. Here and there among the towers were shapes that were not towers, and their expressionless eyes were turned down, watching the ruins at their feet, watching with eternal, immortal patience for some further sign of the life that had been quenched here countless ages ago. More than merely giants stood waiting here. The gray light shifted through the clouds, and beams fell near me. A great company of hooded figures, shrouded in long gray veils, stood without noise or motion facing the broken walls. They were tall as tall men, but more slender. The nearest was not more than twelve feet from me, but its hood was facing away. Their next two of the covens stood perhaps twenty feet from me, near the broken gate. 
It was a miracle I had not brushed against them in the dark as I crept between them, unknowing of my danger. Even as quiet as I was, how had they not heard the tiny noises I had made creeping in their very midst? Then I knew it was not the noise carried by the air they heeded. It was not with ears they heard. They were spirits mighty, fell, and terrible, and they did never sleep nor pause in their watch. A hundred years, a thousand, a million meant nothing to them. They had been waiting for some unwise child of man to sneak forth from the last redoubt to find the empty house of his sire, dead these many years. They had been waiting for a thought of fear to touch among them, fear like mine. With one accord, making no sound at all, the dozens of hooded figures turned, and the hoods now faced me. I felt a coldness enter into my heart, and I knew that I was about to die. For I felt the coldness somehow, and I know not how this could be, and I know not how I knew it, was swallowing the very matter and substance of my heart into an awful silence. My cells, my blood, my nerves were being robbed of life, or of the properties of matter that allow physical creatures such as man to be alive. I turned to flee, but I fell, for my legs had turned cold. I made to raise my forearm to my lips and bite down on the capsule, but my arm would not obey. My other arm was numb also, and the great weapon fell from my fingers. Nor could my spirit sense the power in the metal any longer, despite that the shaft and blade were still whole. The discus was still alive, but I wondered if its soul had been destroyed, and feared I was to follow. Then I could neither move my eyes nor close them. Above me there was only black cloud, lit here and there with a creeping gray half-light. A sharp rock was pushed into the joint between my gorget and the neck piece of my helm, so that my head was craned back at a painful angle, and yet I could not lift my head. The silent ones made no noise, and I could not see if they approached, but in my soul I felt them drifting near, their empty hood bent toward me, solemn and quiet. Then the clouds above me parted. I saw a star. Whether all the stars had been extinguished, or whether the zone of radiation that surrounds our world, transparent in former ages, had grown opaque, or whether there was merely a permanent layer of cloud and ash suffocating our world, helping to slow the escape of heat, had been debated for many an age among savants and knowledgeable people. Of these three, I had always inclined to the last opinion, thinking the stars too high and fine to have been reached by the corrupt powers of the nightlands. That the night had power to quench the stars was too dread to believe, but that the stars should have the grace to push aside the smog and filth of the earth and allow one small man one last glimpse of something high and beautiful was too wondrous to hope. I cannot tell you how I knew it was a star, and not the eye of some beast leaning down from a cliff and possibly high above, or some enigmatic torch of the night world suspended and weightless in the upper air bent on strange and dreadful business. And yet more than my eye was touched by the silvery ray that descended from that elfin light. I saw it was diamond in heaven indeed, but somehow also a flame and a burning ball of gas, immensely far away. And how such a thing could have a mind, and be aware of me, and turn and look at me, and come to my aid in my hour of need, I cannot tell you. For diamonds and flames and balls of gas do not have souls. But neither can I tell you how a hill shaped like unto a grisly, inhuman thing, could sit and watch the last redoubt of man without stirring and flinching for a million years, is the one more unlikely than the other? I felt strength burning in me, human strength, and I raised my head. The coven of silent ones was here, but the blank hoods were lifted and turned toward the one star. The thoughts, the cold thoughts of the silent ones were no longer in me. A fog was rising. As mild and as little as the light from the star might have been, it somehow made little fingers of white mist seep up from the sand. There may have been a natural rather than a supernatural explanation for this, but I doubt it. Like a veil, the pure cloud rose to hide me from the enemy. The delicate rays of this one star still shined through these pearly curtains and illuminated them and made every bead and hanging breath of the mist all silvery and fair to see. If this were not supernatural, then the supernatural world should be ashamed that such wonders can be wrought by merely natural means, by starlight and little water drops. 
While the silent ones were closed off behind a wall of fog, I picked up my weapon and crept away. I was blinded, so I followed the star. Here and there about me in the silvery mists, I could see looming shadows of the silent ones, terrible and motionless. And yet they did not sense me, or do me hurt, which I attest is starkly impossible, unless but that one of the good powers that old tales said sometimes saved men from the horrors of the night had indeed suspended the normal course of time, or relaxed the iron laws of nature out of mercy. No one knows these things. The star led me to where a little stand of moss bush spread. Beneath the bush was hid a door, set flat into the rock underfoot, and one of the leaves of the door had been forced inward a little way against its hinges. The crooked opening was large enough, perhaps, to admit a man, or the small, nasty, crawling things and vermin of the nightlands, stinging snakes and centipedes, but too narrow to let any of the larger brutes or monsters pass in. The star went out, and the mist that hid me began to part. I saw tall shadows slanting through the mists and feared the silent ones were drifting near. I doffed my helm and breastplate and undid my van braces, that I might be lithe and small enough to squeeze in through this crack. It might have been wise to drop my armor into the crack before I went in, but wisdom also warned me not to make a clatter, so I pushed the armor plates beneath a moss bush, where, I hoped, they would not be seen. The edges of the door scraped and cut me, I was blood-streaked when I fell into the dark place beneath. Of the wonders of the city of Usire I have not space to say. Let it suffice that there were many miles of rock that had been mined out to form the fields and farms beneath the dome, and that the dome itself, even broken, was a mighty structure, many miles across and half a mile high. There were places where the feet and legs of the behemoths had broken through the roof, and I would peer out across a shattered balcony, to see the knees and thighs of rough and leprous hide, knowing that somewhere, far below, were feet. And the palaces and museums, fanes and libraries of Usire, a great civilization of which the folk of the last redoubt know nothing, lay trampled underfoot. Many layers of roof and hull had been shattered in the footfalls of the giants back ages ago when the giants walked. Darkness and cold had entered in. I found the doors of Orichalcum I had seen so often in my dreams. The images carved into the right-hand leaf of the door were as I had seen them exactly, now that the memory came back to me, as I had carved them in a former life. The right-hand door was of the past. Here were sculpted images of starfarers landing their winged ships on worlds of bone and skull, horror on their faces, as they came to know our Earth was the only world remaining in all the universe not yet murdered. The fall of the moon was pictured, and the sundering of the earth crust. Here were the road-makers, greatest of all the ancient peoples, and there were the cliff-dwellers, whose mighty cities and empires clung to endless miles of chasm walls during the age when the upper surface of earth was ice, but the floor of the great rift was not yet cool enough for men to walk upon it. Here was an image of the founder, tracing the boundaries where the last redoubt would rise with a plow pulled by a type of beast now long extinct. And this was a legend from the first eon of the last redoubt, and twenty eons and one have passed since that time. The left-hand door held images from the end of time. The breaking of the gate was pictured here, and the severing of man into two races, those trapped far below ground, and those trapped in the highest towers. When all the middle miles of the last redoubt were made the inhabitation of unclean things that wallowed in the darkness, the tragedy of the last flight was pictured, millions of women and children of the upper folk attempting escape by air in a winged vehicle like those used by our earliest ancestors. The image showed the winged ship, buoyancy lost, falling among the waiting tribes of sardonic abhumans, the loathly gargoyles and furious nighthounds. The time of the final thousand was shown, when all living humans would know not just their own lives, but the lives of all who came before so that each man was a multitude, each woman, all her mothers. Here was a picture of the last child, born by candlelight in her mother's ice-rimmed coffin. There was an icon of the triage, three shades representing all the dead fated to fade from the world's dying aura, were bowing toward the wise-eyed child, proffering their ghostly dirks hilt first. Any shade the last child shunned had no hope of further human vessels for its memories. 
The final panel of the furthest future, which formed the highest part of the left-hand door, showed the archons of high darkness, anti-seraphim and other almighty powers of the universal night, seated on thrones among the ruins of the last redoubt. And while silent ones bowed to them, and the southern watching thing fawned and licked their dripping hands, all the books and tools and works of man were pictured, heaped upon the bonfire, around which abhumans cavorted and the greater servants were shown eating the lesser servants at feast. These images were fanciful, mere iconography. The ulterior beings have no form or substance, no shape that can be drawn with pencil or carved in stone. Nonetheless, the doormaker carved well the nightmare scene, and I knew what she meant to portray. There was on the right, in the past, at highest part of the door, an image directly opposite the image of the triumphant powers of darkness at feast. Here, golden, was the many-rayed orb which was meant to represent the last sunset, which was the earliest legend of the earliest time. And in the foreground, here was the mother and father of mankind, holding hands sadly and watching the dusk. The man was pictured with one hand raised, as if to salute or bid farewell. Whatever unimaginable age of gladness had ruled the upper air before that time. I was cheered to think that even then, my ancient self who made these doors had not considered the days of light to be a myth to be ashamed of. I put my shoulder to the cunningly carven panels and pushed. They were the doors to a museum, of course. Here I found the dusty and rusted wreckage of broken stalls and looted displays, tarnished machines, broken weapons dead glasses and empty bookshelves. But in the ruin was one machine, shaped like a coffin, still bright. Light came from its porthole. This casket was a type long forgotten in the last redoubt, able to suspend the tiny biotic motions we call life, each cell frozen, and carefully thought again by an alchemy that revives each cell separately. These once had been used in eons when men ventured into the void, but those who slept too long in them came out changed, troubled by strange dreams sent to them from minds that roamed the deepest void between the stars and loyal to things not of earth. Inside the casket was Parathos. I wiped the frost from the porthole to peer inside. He was horribly maimed. Scar tissue clotted his empty eye sockets. His left arm was off at the elbow, a mere stump. No wonder he had never attempted to find the last redoubt again, blind, maimed, and without the capsule. A few minutes' search allowed me to find a spirit glass in an alcove. I brought it back and connected it to the physician's socket by means of a thinking wire cannibalized from an inscription machine. I tilted the glass until I caught an image of Parathalus in it, and there, shining at the bottom of his soul, Tangled in a network of associations, dreams, fears, and other dark things, like a last redoubt. Besieged by fear yet unafraid, was the thing in us that knows and recognizes the master word. I whispered the master word. The shining, timeless fragment in his soul pulsed in glad recognition. Human. Parathaus was human. The master word stirred something in him. Even though he was frozen, his blood and nerves all solid, there was sufficient action in his brain to allow his thoughts to reach through the armor of the coffin and touch my brain. You came. I came. It was not unexpected that even a frozen man could still send and hear thoughts. If his method of suspending life could have also suspended the spiritual essences of life and kept them safe, the star voyages of early man would not have ended in such nightmarish horror, for the spacemen would have been deaf to the things that whispered in the dark of the etheric spaces, and would have returned from the void whole and sane. Slay me, and then slay yourself. We are surrounded by the powers from the House of Science. I came to save you, not to kill you. I merit death. I slew Murdath. Murdath? She lived and died many generations ago. Helenor. I mean Helenor. My only love. The fairest maid our pyramid ever knew. She was to be my bride. And I also slew her child. 
The child in the womb reached out and touched my mind and told me things I should not have heard. Your child? No. A creature who carried her off to the tower without doors and violated her. Things were done to her womb to permit her to conceive a non-human. I winced at the thought. What creature? An abhuman? No, though it answered to them. The bridegroom was a thing bred or made by the arts of the House of Silence in the centuries since the fall of the lesser redoubt. I knew that when the redoubt fell, out of all those millions, only Murdath had been saved. Of the rest, not all of them had been allowed to die without suffering, especially not the women, and most were put to pain of the type death does not ease. You call it bridegroom. She married it? The abhumans mock our sacraments. You know why. I nodded. It is not enough that we die. That will not satisfy them. They must make the things we deem precious seem grotesque and ugly, even to us, so that there is nothing fair left in the world. I speak of the lesser servants, the ones once human. We are not in the thoughts of the greater ones. The bridegroom bit my weapon out of my hand and tore off my arm, but the capsule buried in my forearm broke beneath its iron teeth, and venom filled its mouth. It died instantly? No. Its unnatural life stayed in its frame long enough to slay the rest of my men. I killed the child with my thoughts, for its life was weak. But Helenor by then had no soul to slay, and I strangled her one-handed while she clawed out my eyes. Such was my last sight. Slay me, that I may ease from seeing it ever and again forever. Many a weary mile I have walked to save you, Perithos, for I will not fail of the promise we made as children. Why did you call out to me, across all miles of the nightlands, if you did not wish me to bring you back into the warmth and human comfort of our mighty home? I cannot open the door. Do you mean the casket lid? The door that opens to escape from a life that grows intolerable. The door that honor commands men to use when all other doors are shut. You must open the door for me. You of all men know that there is something beyond that door, and that it opens back into this life again. But with forgetfulness, blessed forgetfulness, to quench the pain of memory, there is much I must forget. A picture came from his brain elements into the visual centers of my brain. It was an image of Helenor, her eyes filled with childish faith in the man she loved. She raised a gauntlet too large for the slender hand that bore it, and tilted back a helmet too large for her, and raised her mouth for one last kiss, before she slid down a rope from a small window in the postern gate. Away across the black and grainy soil of the nightlands she walked, and there she was, outlined for a moment against the glow of the electric circle. Then she was gone. She had not been moving as those who are prepared or trained to move, skulking from rock to rock, or standing motionless to let one's gray cloak blend with the gray background, avoiding discolored patches of ground. She did not know how to walk, and she dragged the great weapon behind her, for the weight was more than she could bear, and she wheeled it like a wheelbarrow on its blade, an image that would be comical were it not so horrifying. His thoughts were clear as crystal, sharp as knives. She will not be born anew. The darkness consumed her. I have destroyed her forever. I sent her into the night without a capsule, without the words and rites, without the exercises of the soul and mind, carrying a weapon she had never swung before, in armor too big for her. More images. Parathos had sent her out. He lowered her on a rope from a window in the postern gate and watched her walk away. His gift allowed him to choose a time when the portreeve was one who admired his fame too much to turn him in, and the gate warden he could blackmail with knowledge taken from the man's own guilty mind. The enormity of the crime was too great for me to take in. I was overcome with emotion at that moment. The strength left my legs, and I sat. My weapon I put down, the first time it had left my grip in weeks. I put my head in my hands. Madness! I said, madness. There were simpler ways to die, and ways that do not carry hundreds of dead down with you. 
Was she so jealous of Murdoch? Did the law that forbids women to walk the nightlands offend her so much? Did she so much want to be thought more manly than a man? It was not enough for her that she was more fair than women? That was not the reason. Eventually, I said softly, Why? For love. What? Love. Surely that emotion excuses us from all limits, all law. We thought we could be together here. We thought the stronghold of Usire would provide us some sanctuary against the night, but that we would be far from the pyramid, free to live as we wished. Madness! Would she step to the bottom of the sea without a suit, or play with lepers without an immunity? Ah, but you don't know about oceans or lepers, do you? All old things are dead to you, including the wisdom of our laws. Some old things I know. I gave her a harquebus from a museum and brought it to life with the earth current. I rendered it obedient to her with my thought. The piece was able to discharge a streamer over nine hundred yards, carrying a charge enough to kill a dumb giant. You know why the ancients forbade us to use such weapons. The energy can be sensed from miles away, even of a single shot. Or do you? How little do you know of the world you live in, of what has come before? Why trick her into killing herself in such a foolish fashion? Surely it would have been simpler to throw her from an embrasure, or dash out her brains against a post, or bury her alive? Did you want to feed them? Feed the horrors? I was imagining her, surprised by a petty worm or scorpion, touching off the voltage, and sending a lightning bolt echoing across the darkened land. I imagined the thing we see shadowed in one of the windows of the House of Silence, tilting its dark head toward the source of the energy noise. I imagined night hounds, pack upon pack, swarming down from the lesser dome of far too many doors, baying as they came. I spoke in a voice made hollow and weak from despair and disgust. How could he overlook what was so plain to see? No woman ever must travel in the nightlands. Here are monsters to slay us. She thought she would foresee them, or that my spirit would warn me ere they came near. And, and, and what? I had prepared everything for us. A capsule she could carry in her cloak. An instrument that would lead us to where the stronghold of Usire was, by the traces of earth kind that still gave off. If the instrument sensed nothing, we would turn and come back home. And so there was no risk. We felt that the monsters would stay clear of any land where the earth current was running. And if we found this place, we could reconnect the white circle to the current, sanctify the ground, and erect an air clog of our own, stronger than that we had left. It would have been not as safe as home, but safer. You sent her off by herself? By herself? I meant to meet her before the hour was gone. Less. Forty minutes, no more. Time enough for me to descend and escape out of a wicket, carrying the other gear. I had to stay behind to joggle the power, or else the air clog would not have parted for us. From a low window, we had together picked the rock where she was to hide and wait for me. It was less than eighty yards from the gate. Eighty yards! She could not have mistaken the rock. We had studied every feature lovingly. She could not have mistaken the rock. It was cleft like a mitre, and one part jutted like my sister Fiji's nose. He said more, much more then. Many excuses, much sophistry. I could not make myself heed his thoughts. My own thoughts were too loud. I kept picturing what it must have been for her, to be trapped in the darkness of the outer lands, being hunted by night hounds. To have the eyes of inhuman beings searching the unending night. And then, after hunger and weariness and nightmares and false hopes, to be found by the cold ones and taken to their secret places. And to have one's nervous system laid open and all one's intimate thoughts laid bare. And then to be raped by unclean creatures. And then to marry one's rapist. And all this time to wonder why one's own beloved, one's true love, the beloved you trusted and cherished above all others, to have him merely abandon you to this fate. I was walking up and down the aisles of the ruined museum, looking for an axe or heavy bar. It was not something I meant to think, 
but I was looking for something to smash in the casket lid and expose the freezing innard to the air. Even in my anger and turmoil, I note that it never occurred to me to use the discus on him. It is something we only ever swing against monsters. I do not know if any human person has ever been struck with one. Parathaus broke into my endless circle of thought. I tried. I was prevented. I wanted to come after her immediately. That was our plan, but... I pounded my fist against the portal where his frozen, maimed face was held in ice. The noise was loud, but the glass held, despite the hardness of my gauntlets. Like water bubbling from a whole jug, my anger left me. Men who have eaten nothing but the tablets for weeks do not have stomach enough to stay angry. I sat down again. But you were arrested by the magistrates, weren't you? Yes, I said. They granted clemency on your promise that you would venture out after her. Has the world gone mad? You mocked the law that says no woman ever may venture into the land. They mocked that law that forbids a man of unsound mind or unfit character may go. You were but a callow youth, perhaps that can excuse. But they were judges, men of the law. The judges thought that no punishment the hand of man could mete out would match this. And no one else could trace the screaming. Her voice you could hear in your head back to the source. They needed you to find her. The silent ones let her scream so that others would come forth from the pyramid and be destroyed. They opened their barrier to let my call reach you for the same reason. I nodded sadly, and the silent ones would have had me had not one of those powers that no one can explain intervened. You know I betrayed you. You were afraid the Silent Ones would destroy you unless you called other children of men out from the last redoubt. It is an old, old trick, an old fear. A fear you do not share. What is wrong with your thoughts? Why are you not afraid? I was spared. The Silent Ones will not permit us to leave this place. I am wounded and blind. How can you hope we can cross the Nightlands together? Helenor said she saw many pairs of boot prints leading out, but only one coming back in. You will live, not me. It is fated, I said. Fated. I don't understand why Helenor went forth. Were her visions of the future unclear? Did she have some vision that told her she was to be a wife and mother, but it cruelly deceived her? I deceived her. She saw what was to come. I told her not to believe her visions. Why did she listen to such a stupid idea? Because you deceived her. You convinced her that fate could be changed. I said the opposite, that we must endure what could not be changed. She was convinced of that, too. Even when I talked her into venturing forth, in her mind there was nothing but grim resolve. Women sacrifice much and suffer much to become our wives, to bear our children. Nature inclines them to endure great sacrifice. A sacrifice for what? For what gain? She knew that bloodshed and destruction would spring from her going forth. What? Something like laughter came from his frozen brain. She saw far, far into the future. Isn't it obvious? I found the shaft. I reconnected the main leads. I restored the power, as I had planned from the start. But it took me months. What do you mean? What? Are you an idiot? The casket is powered. The yes current is alive, here, still strong, but deep, deep beneath the rock. And so the victory of the dark powers here is not complete. You must return to the last redoubt with this nose. If they drive a shaft deep enough, and at an angle to find the sources directly beneath this spot, the last redoubt will live out its promised span of life five million years hence. Otherwise, we fail within a few hundred years. The engineering needed to drive a shaft so many miles to find so small a place might be beyond the powers of the present generation of men. But there would be generations to come. The gardens and fields and mines beneath the great redoubt were so extensive that... Compared to that work, what Parathos proposed was not an insurmountable matter. 
I cannot explain why I laughed. The laughter was bitter on my tongue. I said, So all our proud and vain dreams of returning as heroes will come true, won't they? We will be lauded. I can think of no more just punishment for folly than to have foolish wish come true. We? I admit the word surprised me as well. It just slipped out. But once I had said it. We. I am blind and crippled and wicked besides. You are coming with me. If I return to the pyramid, the magistrates will condemn me to death. And so your wish shall be granted. Or perhaps the law that you may not stand twice for the same offense will forbid a new hearing. If judges still uphold our laws, which seems not the fashion among these modern folk. In any case, it is their affair, not mine. Why do you not bestow the death my acts have merited? Have you no sense of justice? Well, obviously, not so much as I should have. A just man would have not answered your plea. I felt a stirring in the ether, as if he were gathering his brain elements to send a thought, but the thought was too confused, too full of shame to send. Had his face not been frozen, I wonder what his expression might have given away. You put me on trial, didn't you? You pretended to misplace the master word. If I had been a man of justice, obedient to our laws, I would have been safe and never answered you. I failed your trial, and you condemned me to death and annihilation at the hands of the silent ones. Your justice condemned me, but something spared me. I wonder why. Why was I spared? You knew you should not come. Why did you come? I came because I am a romantic fool. The kind of fool it is easy to fool. But he had asked the wrong question. Don't ask why I came. Ask why I had been permitted to come. Ask why the cunning of the House of Silence did not prevail. A miracle was wrought to permit me to be here. My certain destruction and doom was set aside. Why? I saw now why the star had parted the clouds to touch me and to restore my life to me. It was. At once, a reprieve and a punishment, heavier than I could imagine. For my punishment was to stand, in relation to Parathaus, as that star had stood to me, and save him. To be his friend, despite all his crimes, all his foolish pride and boastful madness, to be his friend, nonetheless, and save him. Perhaps the good power that had saved me meant to save the last redoubt as well, to let the message go through telling where another vein of the earth current could be found in the shrinking core of the planet. But somehow I doubted it. The things that seem great and momentous to men, I am sure, are of little matter to the ulterior powers who sometimes protect life. I knew the words to start the rebirth cycle for the coffin, and how to adjust the feeds to bring the earth current back into his body so that uneven thawing would not mar him. I picked up my weapon again and leaned on it. The earth current within the haft was aware of the current flowing in the casket, a phenomenon spiritualists call affected resonance. It felt good to have the warlike spirit of my discus propping me up at that moment. In a former life, I owned a boarhound, and his loyalty had been not unlike this. Parathos touched his mind to mine again, but weakly. His spirit was faint for his aura was being drawn back close to his flesh in preparation for the decanting. He would sleep many hours before the lid would open, and he would awake. But I heard him. I don't understand. How can you not understand me? You've seen my thoughts. I see your thoughts, but they are senseless. Strange. My thoughts seemed perfectly clear to me. The same madness that drove Parathos into the night was the only thing that might save him from it. The love that binds friends or brothers is no less real than that which binds wooer and beloved. The power that saved me surely knew what a boastful and foolish man I was. But mothers do not strangle their babies if they are born lame. The stars do not cease to shine on us if we men cripple ourselves. And I should not abandon my friend whether he was a true friend to me or not. 
Men's souls are crooked and unsound things, not good materials out of which to build friendships, families, households, cities, civilizations. But good or no, these things must be built, and we must craft them with the materials at hand, and make as strong and stubborn a redoubt as we can, lest the horrors of the night should triumph over us, not in some distant age to come, but now. We are surrounded by the silent ones. We are fated to die. One of us will perish before we regain the pyramid. Helenor saw only one pair of footprints leading back. How is it possible that we both shall live? But by then the cycling process was too advanced, and his thoughts lost focus. Many hours must pass before I would open the lid and answer his question. As I carried him on my back, out past the golden doors, I led his blind hand to touch the bar-relief on the left panel of the golden doors. Here was the panel carved long ago by Helenor in a former time, with a small depiction of one small event on what, to her, had been the future, now our present. Here was a man without a breastplate or helm, wearing only gauntlets and greaves, carrying a one-armed man on his back. A blindfold, but I knew now it was a bandage, covered his eyes. The image showed a star shining down on them, and the gates of the last redoubt opening to receive them. Only one pair of footprints let in. Read by Aaron Jones <laughs>